chapter of, of the Bible. Uh, now, there's a small chance that won't happen, but I, I think we can. If we need to speed through some things, we can. Um, uh, so we're looking at the genealogy. Our favorite part of the Bible, of course, is the genealogy. Um, and, uh, uh, but hopefully, we saw last week with the genealogy of Cain, his descendants, that there, there's a lot more there than just begats. Um, it is, in fact, a, a, a quite a rich passage uh, to, to invest our, our time in. Uh, so we saw the line of Cain last Wednesday. We are looking at the line of Seth uh, this evening. So let's start uh, in verses 25 to the end of the chapter, and we'll, we'll pick up from there. Um, it says, And Adam knew his wife again. She bore a son, called his name Seth, for she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel. For Cain killed him. To Seth, also a son was born. He called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. So we're going to start here um, yeah, with the introduction to the line of Seth. One of the things you'll, you'll find is there's almost two introductions to this. One is going to come from Moses, the writer of Genesis. The other is going to come from the source that Moses is citing. Okay, so, so this is the first one here. Um, we see the euphemism for, for new there, verse 25. We've talked about that multiplication, so don't need to go to. But, but we meet Seth here for the very first time. Um, now, Seth, um, the birth of Seth needs to, it, it corresponds both to the birth of Cain and the birth of Abel, right? So as regards to Cain, remember that the big storyline of the Bible is the, this, this battle between two offsprings, two seeds. One is the good seed. Right, the seed of the woman. The one is the bad seed. That is the seed of the of the dragon, right, the serpent. Right. So, and the story of Cain and Abel uh, is the opposite of what we would expect. Uh, if we remember that Eve assumed that Cain was the good seed. Remember, she remember the funny thing she said at the beginning of chapter four. I have begotten a man. Right. I mean, no mother ever says that upon you know holding their baby for the first time. Right. You know, uh, you know, you, you won't see no Snapchat filters for that. Okay, they, they just don't exist. Behold, I've begotten a man. Uh, because she sees in Cain the fulfillment of Genesis 3.15, that the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. Uh, but what we discover is Cain is actually bad seed, seed of the serpent. Uh, and Abel's the good seed. He, he, he's the righteous one, and Cain is the unrighteous one. But instead of seeing Abel triumphing over the bad seed, we see the bad seed triumphing over uh, the good seed. That's the story of humanity, isn't it? That often the, the wicked do prosper. Uh, and often prosper over the, the righteous. And, and so we are stuck here, right? I mean, if, if, if good is reigning, and that's what much of chapter, 20, uh, chapter 4 is about. Not just the, the, the murder of Abel, but the line of Cain seems to get progressively worse. Climaxing in Lamech. Remember that Cain avenged sevenfold, uh, Lamech seventy-sevenfold. Right? We talked about that last week, the connection to Jesus with the forgiveness uh, Peter says, you know, forgive seven times like Cain? No, 77 times. So forgiveness reaches even people like, like Laman. Well, now the story turns to another child. So that is why Seth's name means uh, appointed. Even you, it can mean replacement. Seth is the replacement for Abel. And again, we need to see this as an act of grace. Uh, much as we saw God intervene for Adam and Eve, intervene for Cain, now he intervenes for for, for humanity in the birth of Seth. Seth is the replacement. He is appointed uh, by God for his ultimate plan of redemption. This is an act of grace. Though humanity is quite wicked, and that's demonstrated in the Cain story, God still appoints for one who will bear good, good seed. Um, and one of the things you, you, you notice is that Eve is a little more humble here, isn't she? Um, so she, she bears a son, called his name Seth, for she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. You see, you see the word appointed there, it's related to the word Seth. Uh, so, so the word Seth is essentially in, in that verse twice. Uh, but you see, it's much more humble than, behold, I've begotten a man. Behold, I've, I've begotten one that is a savior. Um, so, um, oh, and by the way, that word offspring... Um, is the same word Genesis 3.15. Uh, I, think, I do think that's on purpose. The seed, the seed of the woman and whatnot. Okay, so, so Seth is born. There he is. Uh, he raises a son by the name of Enosh. Enosh means man. Some say it means weak or faint one. Um, and you can spiritualize that all you want. 
either he has a low view of this boy, right? That could, could be the case. Um, oh no, this one's going to act like his mother, right? And give him, give him a name like that. Um, or uh, it could mean theologically that mankind himself has become weak. And, and remember that, that Seth's brother is, is, demonstrates that. And so in naming his son, he picks up on that language. I, I, you do with that whatever you want. I, some of these names, I think we have to be careful not to read too much into them. Um, but nevertheless, so, so there, there is Enosh. Um, now, what a contrast little weakling is here to, to Cain's line, right? Remember, uh, they gave names like power, <laughs> beautiful, right? Those sort of names. Uh, Seth's line, he's a weakling, right? I, I mean, it's, it's, they at least have a better theology of depravity, I guess. Well, verse 26, it says, People began to call upon the name of the Lord. Now, this signifies the difference between the line of Cain and the line of Seth, and this gives a clear indication uh, that this is the good seed. Some say that that phrase attaches to Enosh. Enosh was really the first to call upon the name of the Lord. I, it's all about semantics and, and grammar, but uh, the whole point is that this line is characterized, remember this is the introduction, is characterized by call upon the name of the Lord. That phrase shows up over and over again in Genesis, always in the context of worship. So uh, after Abraham gets called by God in Genesis 12, what does he do? Uh, he calls upon the name of the Lord, right? Uh, by the way, AI there does not mean artificial intelligence. Sorry, young fellas. Sorry. It's a place name. And uh, no, uh, uh, the Tesla guy, Musk, he, he's not from there. I'm sorry. Uh, Genesis 13, uh, Abraham uh, uh, called upon the name of the Lord, built an altar. Chapter 21 does the same thing. We've talked about chapter 21 before. In 40 years, we'll get there. Um, notice the connection between the tree and worship. I think that's purpose and connecting to the Garden of Eden. Uh, chapter 26, so he built an altar and called upon the name of the Lord, pitched his tent there. Isaac's servant dug a well. Of course, that is uh, uh, the great well, uh, you know, that pretty infamous. But nevertheless, you, you see the point. Okay, that's the introduction, right? So so God in grace gives Adam and Eve another son, for we could tell they had a bunch of kids. I mean, you got 900 years to have babies. I mean, that's at some point, you're going to have a lot of kids. I, I mean, you don't have to be the Duggars. 900 years to have a lot of kids. But this one is the replacement for Abel. Okay? Now, let, let me just pause there and just say something practical. I know this probably isn't going to affect many of us. Um, but I've seen in ministry where parents do that. Uh, one example in particular where, where a child was lost and, and they immediately had another child essentially to replace that, that child. Uh, and I remember that, that praying that the gender of the baby would be different than the gender of the one they lost. And it wasn't. Um, and and I, I just lived in this fear ever since that that child is always going to live um, with 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 the reality that I wouldn't be here unless X happened. Um, um, we, we parents have got to really guard from idolizing children, idolizing family, idolizing relationships. So this is a real problem I see in, in a lot of homes. Uh, that we, we become like Eve and say, behold, I've forgotten a man. Behold, my Savior is here. I'm a mom or I'm a dad or I'm whatever. That, that's, that's beside the point. Um, just, just something to, I don't know, chew on. All right, so let's look at from Seth to Enoch. Enoch, however you want to say it. And right away, we see that uh, Moses seems to be plagiarizing, if you will, uh, another book. Uh, um, and th this is fascinating to me. Now, I've not done a lot of the math, and so this is MacArthur. If he's wrong, then he's been wrong before. That did happen one time. And uh, so this is him. Uh, he's a young earth creationist, so if that means something to you, and, and you reject young earth creationism, you probably check what I'm going to say here. He suggests, and, and he's ran the numbers, that Adam lived as long as I believe he said Methuselah, something like that. And then Methuselah died uh, the year of the flood. And in fact, he says that Abraham uh, had lived uh, when Shem was still around. And what, 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 what MacArthur's point is to say is that um, oral tradition at this time can trace itself back really to the beginning. Now, I've not done the math, okay? So you do with that whatever you want. So what Moses is quoting from here, it's a source outside the Bible he puts in the Bible as truth, okay? This, the Bible's full of examples like this. Um, and, and so you see at the beginning, verse 1, this is the book of the generations of Adam. 
So it seems likely he has in front of him a document that, 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 has, that has kept track of all of these generations. Um, and, and Moses lives pretty early on. This obviously would have predated Moses. So that may be something you, you're interested in. It is a book or some sort of document. The Bible's full of this. In fact, the uh, Chronicles and Kings and them, they actually quote from more of the acts of Ahab. Are they not written in the book of, you know, and it'll tell you. We don't have that book, right? It doesn't exist. Um, but nevertheless, uh, you can tell they're using sources. This is what we call source criticism. Uh, uh, people who study the Gospels do this. Why are Matthew, Mark, and Luke so similar? It's because they're borrowing from each other, and there may have been even another source. It could be an oral tradition, something like that. Judas, we'll see, is quoting from uh, uh, First Enoch and his subject of Moses, uh, or even quoting from Second Peter, or Second Peter's quoting from Jude, whatever it is. So this is common that, that you have, and I think it helps us to understand uh, the veracity of Scripture. Nevertheless, the Book of Generations. Uh, by the way, this word generation is the second time it's used in the Bible. The first time is in connection to creation. Chapter 2, verse 4. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. So, so I just find that fascinating. Do whatever you want with it. Um, all right. And notice one thing. Chapter 5, verse 1. This is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them. He blessed them and named them Adam, a man, and uh, when they were created. So there's that image-bearing language again, isn't it? Now, likeness is the term, but image and likeness are practically synonyms, theologically speaking. Um, this reminds us, it tells us a couple of things. One, we are still made in the image of God even in a fallen universe. That's actually an important theological point. Um, just because the world is, is in decay, God's stamp as image bearers are, are, are still on us. So this informs really our, some of our political views, doesn't it? Why is abortion bad? Because though the world has fallen, and that's why you have abortion, those are still image bearers. All right? um, if, if you're following our daily devotions, I think today was Luke 1. Tomorrow will tomorrow be Luke 2. Um, and in there is when, you, you may remember, when John the Baptist leaps in, in his mother's womb. Uh, that says something about the unborn, doesn't it? I, I mean, and it tells us something about John the Baptist, yes, but it tells us something about babies. Uh, and we believe that they are made in the image of God. So our view of bioethics really stands there. Our view of immigration, racism, all of that stems from, fundamentally, our view of God and, and his, his image bearers. Um, but we also need to see that this description is used in relation to Seth, signifying that God is doing something through the line of Seth. He's not saying that the line of Cain weren't image bearers, but it's to emphasize that this line is going to fulfill the promises that, that God had for, for man. Um, and verse 2 is a summary of the sixth day of creation, isn't it? God made both men and women equal. Uh, he blessed them both equally, and he named them man, Adam. All right. All right, so uh, let's get, get to verse 3 here. When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. 130 years still having kids. That will get you on the news for sure. Right? 130 years. Man. You know, I hope that at least Adam and Eve, hopefully they, they dated a long time. Like they didn't rush into anything. I mean, like, you know, they're teenagers. You know, they got that puppy love. And you think Adam and Eve's parents, they didn't have any, in case you haven't read your Bible. And you're like, Adam, why don't you just go slow with this one? You got like 850 more years left. Just just go slow with this one. All right, I don't know. Uh, but 130 years. Uh, imagine all those decades of agony. We don't know when, when Nestle had Cain and Abel. But it could have been decades of agony. Uh, and you know, what, what he has gone through. But here, here he has, has Seth. A couple of things we need to know uh, about these long lifespans. I don't think I put them up there now. Um, no. All right. So first of all, the lifespans of the uh, pre-flood uh, Sumerian king. So, so what I mean by that is the Bible is not the only ancient document that includes a flood story. Now, you're probably aware of that. Virtually every ancient culture has a flood story. Some are local, some are global, whatever. The Sumerians are considered the first real ancient civilization. And, and, and you, we can do the same with the Babylonian history as well. If you were to take their pre-flood stories, 
And they talk about kings. There's no kings here in, 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 in the Bible, right? Uh, uh, you have image bearers, not kings. The kings become like gods. In, in the Bible, God puts a stamp on men. So, but in terms of the, the length of ages, um, we have here, Adam's going to live for about 930 years. I'll put it all up at the end. Um, the kings, the shortest life of the, one of the Sumerian kings was supposedly 18,600 years long. That's, that's the shortest life, right? He just didn't live a very long life compared to the other ones, okay? That's the shortest, 18,600 years. So a lot of people read these, these, these years, you know, having babies at 130. That, I mean, can you imagine that? The, the, uh, that's a lot of years on Social Security, Right? You think you have a retirement issue for the state government now, right? I mean, you think Social Security is bankrupt now. Imagine being on Social Security for 800 years. Um, but uh, what the Bible has in terms of years, nothing compared to those. Um, so what some people have, have tried to do is they've tried to shorten these lifespans. There's no way someone can live 930 years. Okay, what are you going to do with these numbers? Well, some take the numbers and they kind of recalculate them. The reason is because the way the ancients did numbers was not the way we do numbers. We, we follow numbers through uh, Arabic numbers, right? Uh, they, they come from, from or, or the Aramaic numbers. They come from the Aramaic world. Uh, no, it's Arabic, gosh. Uh, the Islamic world gave us our numbers, okay? Um, well, Hebrew and uh, the ancient, um, ancient Near East was very different. So you can redo the numbers and shorten the numbers. But here's the problem with doing that with these. Let's say you have Adam dying at the ripe old age of 70, okay? As opposed to 930, okay? And you think, well, that's more reasonable, I guess. Um, the problem is that now he's having children when he's about seven or eight years old. That doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. So what most believe is what you have here with these long lifespans is the world prior to the flood is radically different than the world after the flood. And when you think about it, it's not a big leap. Let's say it, it's going to rain tonight, let's say, for the next week. Your house is flooded. I don't care how good your gutters are. It's flooded. Will your house age as a result? Yeah. That's what it does. Chances are, the first thing you're going to do when the waters recede is you're going to throw everything out. And you're going to start looking at at the floor, you're going to look at the foundation. Why? Because your house just aged 40 years. That's what water does. And, and you have to be very careful around sitting water. Right? This, I mean, so now what you have is a flood that lasts for months. Well, that's going to have a dramatic effect on, on the environment, on lifespan. So once you have the flood, those lifespans drop pretty, pretty quickly. Um, notice there, uh, so it, it, the... Uh, um, Oh, one other thing. Uh, I thought I had it in here. Uh, verse 3, he followed, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image. Um, yeah, notice two things. Number one, likeness comes before image here. It's the opposite of Genesis 1 where image precedes likeness. Uh, I don't think there's anything theological there. But you'll notice whose image is Seth made in. It's in Adam's. That's the tragedy of humanity, isn't it? Now, what it's not saying is that he's not made in the image of God. But it's a reminder that Seth is still his father's son, as was Cain. That, that's the pressing reality. There is a good seed and a bad seed, but you know what? They both came from the same seed. Seth is, bears the image of, of his father. And the older we get, the more we realize that, don't we? When you're a teenager, or you meet that, that girl, that guy, you know you're going to marry, you're going to say, when I become a father and mother, it's, I'm not going to be like my parents. <laughs> I give you 10 minutes. 10 minutes to wipe the tears, you see that baby, and all of a sudden, you're going to talk just like him. Talk just like him, right? Um, so, uh, verse 5. Um, uh, Thus all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. That phrase... And he died will be stated about eight times in the following verses. In fact, it is the number one purpose, if not number one, number two. The promise of God would probably be number one. But it certainly is one of the main purposes of the genealogy is to remind you the curse upon humanity. The day you eat of this fruit is the day you die. God's commission to be fruitful and multiply hasn't changed. But now that commission comes with a curse. 
you will die. So Adam lives, he has a child, and he dies. Guess what his son Seth does? He lives, he has a child, and he dies. Guess what Adam's grandson does? He lives, he has children, and he dies. Guess what Adam's great-grandchild does? He lives, he has children, and he dies. Over and over and over again. So in reading the genealogy, when that pattern is interrupted, you should make a note, right? Because we're going to see that, that being interrupted. Uh, so uh, moving on to, to verse 6, 6 to 8, from Seth to Enosh. Enosh. Um, it says there, verse 6, when Seth had lived 105 years, see, he had a son a lot younger age, he fathered Enosh, Enosh. Seth lived after he followed Enosh 807 years, had other sons and daughters, uh, as you can imagine. Uh, thus, all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. Real quick, in a Kenan uh, means possession. Some have seen a connection to this word with Cain. You can do with that whatever you want. Um, and let's see, uh, and Enosh died, so, so th there you go. Um, and then um, from... Kenan to Mahalalel, which we will name something Mahalalel one of these days. That is that is a name. Doesn't it just roll off your tongue? Don't you sound like you sound Hebrew when you say that, like a natural born Hebrew. Mahalalel. Oh, it just mm, like you're quoting the Psalms in the original language. You should try. It. Right, Mahalalel. Oh, just mm, so good, so good. All right, verse twelve. Uh, when uh, Kenan had lived 70 years, much younger guy, um, shortly after he retired from the state, of course, um, he fathered Mahalalel. Kenan lived after he fathered Mahalalel 80, 840 years, had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Kenan were 910 years, and he died. Mahalalel means praise of God. So see, you'll name something Mahalalel before it's all said and done. And Enish died, right? I mean, this, this is all we're getting. We get a name and we get death. Uh, by the way, notice the contrast between birth and death. Life is draped, but death is reality. Every child born here will die. Uh, it's like we're reading Ecclesi Ecclesiastes. Uh, verse 15, the, the 17, when Mahalalel had lived 65 years, much younger guy, had babies, he followed Jared. Um, um, Mahalalel lived after he followed Jared 830 years, had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Mahalalel were 895 years, and he, and he died. Um, um, oh, before I forget, Mahalalel shares a name with a descendant of Judah. That's going to be a common theme here. But nevertheless, um, so we have here Jared. Jared means descendant. Okay? Uh, again, do with that whatever you want. Do you think when Jared got engaged, do you think his new fiance went home, showed the ring to his mother? My wife knows where this is going. What do you think was his soon-to-be mother-in-law's first question. Did you go to Jared's, right? I, I just, it's not a funny joke, but it's just sitting right there. Mark will fix it up for me after the service. It's what he's going to dedicate the rest of the hour to. Um, but you see it, Jared in there. You just, you have to at least do something like that. Um, but he lived 895 years. Poor guy didn't even make it a 900. Don't know what he did to make God mad. But then Mahalalel died, right? And, and again, uh, much like Mahalalel, Jared uh, shares a name with a descendant of Judah. Uh, I think it's significant because Judah is the line of, of Jesus, as is Seth. Verse 18 to 20 is Jared to Enoch. Uh, Jared had lived 162 years. He fathered Enoch. Uh, Jared lived after he followed Enoch 800 years, had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died. Um, now, here's the thing. This is everything we have in the Bible about Jared. But don't worry. There's more to discover if, if you know, you're not so fundamentalist about that Bible stuff. Would you like to know more about Jared? Of course you do. Well, let me tell you more about this Jared. Uh, I mentioned this last week. The book is called Jubilees, Jubilees chapter 4. Uh, what it does is, is it fills in some of the gaps, right? Because where did Cain's wife come from, right? That's what we talked about last week. Well, we are getting names, but they lived a long life. They would have seen some stuff, and don't you want to know what they talked about? I'll read to you from the book of Jubilees. Don't tell Irma Jean that I read from a non-biblical book. Okay, um, in the 11th Jubilee, Jared took to himself a wife. Her name was Barakah, the daughter of, I can't pronounce, a daughter of his father's brother. Yes, so this would be his first cousin. 
Um, in the fourth week of, Ju of, of this jubilee, she bore him a son. In the fifth week, in the fourth year of jubilee, he called him Enoch. So you see, it's borrowing from the biblical story, adding to it, you know, so that, you know, you can make a movie out of it. Um, and he was among the first, he was the first among men that was born on earth who learned a writing and knowledge and wisdom and, and wrote down the signs of heaven according to the order um, um, I'm sorry, that, that's Enoch. We'll get the Enoch here in a second. Here's, here's Ju uh, uh, Jared. In the days of Jared, the angels of the Lord descended on the earth, those who were named watchers, that they should instruct the children of men, that they should do judgment and uprightness on the earth. So there's a connection between uh, Jared and Enoch. Enoch, if I accidentally started to read, Enoch is going to be your big prophet, but Jared taught him everything. Jared is the first, is, is the one whom the watchers, the sons of God, daughters of men, the Nephilim of chapter 6, he's the one that, that started that response, right? And we'll get to the watchers a little bit, hopefully, next week, if, if you don't fire me before that. Okay, let's move to uh, uh, Enoch, means dedicated. Let's, let's move to, uh, from Enoch to, to Noah quickly, and we are going to have to move quickly here. Um, Verse 21 to, to 24, when Enoch had lived 65 years, he followed Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he followed Methuselah 300 years, had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. That's noteworthy, isn't it? He didn't live to be 900 and something, 950, right? He didn't, he didn't live that long. He lived to be 300 and, and 65 years. And Enoch walked with God and was not, for God took him. You notice anything different here? There's a lot of things different. He didn't live a very long life because he didn't die. Now, remember, the point of the genealogy, beyond just the promises of God, the good seed, all that sort of thing, the big point is that the day you eat of the fruit is the day you die. That is a spiritual reality. That is a physical reality. Adam lived. He had a bunch of children, and he died. Seth lived, had a bunch of children, and he died. Enosh lived, had a bunch of children, and he died. Jared lived, Mahalalel lived, uh, all of them, they lived, they had children, and they died. Then all of a sudden we meet Enoch, who walked with God, and God took him after only 365 years. Immediately, you as a reader should pick up on this, because that is not the pattern we saw in the line of Cain. In fact, we saw the opposite of, in the line of Cain. Remember who the seventh from the line of Adam through Cain was? It was a guy named Lamech, and Lamech was known as a murderer. Murderer to the extreme, ten times worse than Cain. The seventh of Adam through Seth is Enoch, who walks with God as opposed to revenging himself and murdering men. He's the opposite of Lamech. One dies, a murderer. The other lives forever, right? having walked with God. And that language, walking with God, is the language of friendship. We'll see it Sunday morning uh, when we look at David and Jonathan. And it is similar to what we see in the garden. Remember that, that after they eat of the fruit, what is the first thing that God is described doing? He's walking through the garden. And the image is this is a regular occurrence by which God and man commune together. And the language here of Enoch isn't that one day he woke up after he was done with his teenage years and he thought, I'm going to get serious about my faith. But rather the, the language is, is that for 365 years, he was in communion with God. His faith was very real and it, it, was, it was active. And to, to the point that God took him. That only happened with two people. Elijah is, is, is the second, and some of the same language is used there to describe Elijah's ascension. So this is striking in the narrative. And this is why uh, people have been so fascinated by Enoch, because we don't have anything else there about Enoch, do we? Uh, we have in uh, Hebrews, by faith Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was commanded as having pleased God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists, and he rewards those who seek him. Even the writer of Hebrews doesn't give us any details about Enoch. Right? We, we just don't have any. So as you can imagine, like where did Cain get his wife, the, the Hebrews say, well, we've we got to fill in some gaps here. And I want to give them to you. So I started reading from Jubilee with Jared. Let me read you the rest of Jubilees regarding Enoch. Enoch is the one who learned writing and knowledge and wisdom and who wrote down the signs of heaven according to the order of their months in a book that men might know the seasons of the years according to the order of the seven months. He was the first to write a testimony. He testified to the sons of men among the generations of the earth and recounted the weeks of the Jubilees and made known to them the days of the years and set in order months and recounted the Sabbaths of the year. 
Menodium. And what was and what will be, he saw in a vision of his sleep, as it will happen to the children of man throughout their generations till the day of judgment. He saw and understood everything, wrote his testimony, placed the testimony on earth for all the children of men in, in their generations. In the twelfth jubilee, in the seventh week thereof, he took to himself a wife. Her name was Edna. Isn't that a great name? Um, you didn't expect that. That's more of an American name, I thought, yeah. uh, unless they're a Hebrew name. The daughter of Danel. There we are. We're not in the Bible, but we're close. The daughter of uh, his. So the son of Danel is Mick Danel, because Mick means son of. You guys don't care. Um, um, he was moreover with the angels of God these six jubilees of years, and they showed him everything which is on earth and in the heavens, the rule of the sun. He wrote down everything. He testified to the watchers, those are the Nephilim and whatnot, and who had sinned with the daughters of men. We'll talk about that next week. For these had begun to unite themselves so as to be defiled with the daughters of men, and Enoch testified against them all. He was taken from amongst the children of men, and we conducted him into the Garden of Eden in majesty and honor. And behold, there he writes down the condemnation and judgment of the world and all the wickedness of the children of men. And on account of it, God brought the waters of the flood upon all the land of Eden. For there he was set as a sign that he should testify against all the children of men, and he shall recount all the deeds of the generation till the day of condemnation. He burnt the incense of the sanctuary, even sweet spices except before the Lord. Now, none of this is in the Bible. But because of his significance, these things are made up about him. You'll notice that Jubilee makes a big deal about what Enoch has written down. That's because there is a book called First Enoch. And I'd like to read some of it to you. I don't know if I'm going to read all of it. Um, I'll tell you, well, let me just read one verse from it. Verse 9. Um, I'll tell you, let's go to verse 8 of chapter 1. You can get online and read First Enoch. I've done it. It's a weird book. Look, there is a reason why your ancient astronaut guys, the ones with the wild hair, they love First Enoch because they think the watchers are aliens, right? So if you waste your time on the History Channel all the time, you know, the channel where there's no history, um, um, you're going to hear about Enoch all the time, right? You're welcome. It just, uh, it's, it, the History Channel's gone the way of MTV. I remember in my day, MTV played music. I remember my day when the History Channel had history. All right, but verse 8 of 1 Enoch 1. But with the righteous he will make peace and will protect the elect, and mercy shall be upon them. They shall all belong to God, and they shall, be, they shall be prospered, and they shall all be blessed. He will help them all, and light shall appear unto them. He will make peace with them. And behold, he comes with 10,000 of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and destroy all the ungodly. Now, if any of that sounds familiar, it's because you know your Bible. Jude 14. It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, remember the significance of that, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his holy ones. Now, where is that in the Bible? Where do they say unto thee? It ain't. It comes from first Enoch. Now, real quickly, I do not think, because Jude quotes from first Enoch, first Enoch is scriptural. I think the history of 1 Enoch makes that pretty clear. It's not original. Enoch didn't write it. It was added later. So, so I don't think that's the case at all. I think a lot of 1 Enoch is just wild and unbiblical, and it just goes in a direction the Bible just doesn't allow. What Jude is doing, I believe, he actually quotes from another pseudepigraphal work called The Assumptions of Moses about the burial of, of Moses that Satan and Michael, the archangel, fought over the body. It's nowhere in the Bible, but he quotes from a text that tells that story. I think what Jude is saying in condemning the, the apostates and the false teachers in the church, he's saying, I'll tell you what, I'll quote from their scripture. They stand in judgment like those that Enoch preaches against. I think that's what Jude is doing. We do the same thing, right? By the way, you, you, you philosophy guys, Dinesh D'Souza has made a living off of this. Dinesh D'Souza doesn't want to quote from scripture as his argument against atheism or secularism. He wants to use their arguments against them. So if you, if you read his stuff on um, life after death or evil suffering or even the, the uh, new atheism, or why, is, or why is Christianity good? Uh, he does that. He takes their arguments and then turns it against them. This is basically what Jude is doing here. Okay? Paul will quote from a, a poet saying the Cretans are liars and gluttons. <laughs> you know, um, you know so this is typical in, in, in the Bible. But you can see how the story of Enoch gets wild outside of the Bible. 
But all we know of him is that he lived and he never died. He lived, had children, never died. Something is, is happening here, but that's part of the, the bigger story. So let's look at from, from Methuselah. Uh, Methuselah means man of the javelin. Um, you can do with that whatever you want. Um, but in verse 25 to, to 27, um, we see uh, Methuselah to, to Lamech. When Enoch had lived, I'm sorry, uh, verse 27, when Methuselah had lived 187 years, he fathered Lamech. Methuselah lived after he. He followed Lamech 782 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Methuselah were 969 years and he died. Methuselah is known for one thing. He's the oldest man ever to live according to the Bible. Which is fascinating given who his father was. Now his name, Man of the Javelin, is weird to me. It implies to me, and I could be wrong. This is where we can get into dangerous territory, reading too much in, into the meaning of names. It implies to me he's a man of war. He's a man of violence. And in fact, one preacher, Driscoll, for you boys in the back, uh, suggests that Enoch demonstrates you can live a short life walking with God, or you can live a long life not walking with God. Which one do you want, right? Or uh, hopefully we live long lives live, living for God, yes. We say, if you have to choose, choose walking with God and live a short life, right? That, that was his big point. That may be reading too much in, into the text, but, but it's a fascinating thought nonetheless. Especially considering his son is named Lamech, which we've already saw last week, means powerful. Now Lamech, Cain's descendant, was powerful and he used it to overpower people in violence. We just don't have any details about, about this Lamech at, at all. But it is Lamech who fathers Noah. Verse 28 to 31. Uh, when Lamech had lived 182 years, he followed a son, called his name Noah, saying, now notice we're going to break the pattern again. We get a quote here. Something is unique about this son. This is what Lamech said about Noah. Out of the ground the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief. Now, notice that it was out of the ground that Adam was born, right? At the same time, it is out of the ground that God is cursed. So mankind is cursed because of the fall. The earth itself is cursed because of the fall. But what does Lamech say? Out of the ground comes a man, Adam. But instead of a cursing, this one's going to be a blessing. So it's significant whenever we, we read it. And this one will bring us relief. You just want to have a different word there? What do you have? So you have comfort. That's a good word. You want to got anything other than comfort and relief? Rest? Good, good. That's What translation is doing rest? Are you in footnote? New American Standard, the real Bible. Good. Uh, Don, you got your mess message Bible? What verse is it? It's uh, verse uh, 28. No, 29. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. Okay, so uh, the word is... Phonetically, the same as Noah. That's why you probably have a footnote. ESV has a footnote there. Um, and your Bible may have a footnote. So, so what the translators are telling you is we're going to use this word. But there's something significant with this word. You can translate these other ones in picking up on the, the, the play on words. So well, I'm going to name him Noah because he will bring us Noah. I'm going to name him Rest because he will bring rest. Now, before we know anything else about Noah, and I already know, you know a little something, something about Noah. I get that. Right away, where should your mind go? Day seven of creation. Now, the word Noah is not the same word in Genesis 2, 1 to 3 that talks about God resting from his work. However, the idea of rest is clearly there connecting the two to, to creation. So what you have in this genealogy is a pattern. It's the same pattern. It's the Ecclesiastes pattern. You live, and you die. You live, and you die. You live, and you die. And what does Lamech say? He says, look, out of the ground has come this curse, and it is you and I. And it isn't, don't think of it as the line of Cain go over here, the line of Seth goes over here, and they never interact. We'll see that at the opening of chapter 6 that they probably did interact and with, with some dire consequences. Rather, if you are Lamech, you're Methuselah, you, you have lived over 900 years witnessing the evils of man. 
And his prayer is, out of the ground that God has cursed, God will give us rest. That is the hope of the gospel, isn't it? Where a seed will be born of the woman, and he will crush the head of the serpent. That's the hope of the gospel. And let's not forget, where does Christ he resurrected? From the ground. And that is significant because every man, other than Enoch and Elijah, they lived, they had a family, and they died, and they couldn't stop it. Christ comes out of the ground, comes out of death, and defeats it forevermore. This is a hint of that gospel story. And remember what, what we have said before, the Noah story is a retelling of the creation story, right? So you, 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 got, you got the waters all the way up. That's day two. Right? You have to, you have to separate the, the sky and, and, the, and, and the sea. What comes out of the, the sea in creation? The land. Guess what happens when waters recede? The land comes out of the ground. The, the ark lands on top of a mountain. So man is, is now on the ground. And through the story, what is it you're discovering is that the birds of the air go out. That's day five. And what do they find? They find land. Well, they find the sky first, and then they find land. And then what does, what does Noah do? He does the same thing Adam and Eve did. Right? So, so you have the commands. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth because you're made in the image of God. Don't murder because you're made in the image of God, which connects the Cain and Abel story with the creation story. But then what does Noah do? He does the same thing that Adam did. And his son ends up getting cursed. And you see the same pattern. So the hope of Genesis 3.15 is now not put in Cain. It's now put in Noah. That, that God will bring rest to his creation. It's good writing, isn't it? I, I mean, yeah, it's a genealogy, and we get bored of gene I know you're bored of tears. But you see within the story the riches of God's grace, even with just names. And most of these names, we don't know anything about them. All right, real quick, verse, verse 32. I know it means rest. The sons of Noah, Shem means name. That is yes. There was a band back growing up, a little punk rock band called The Undecided. Yes, give me more than that, right? That is just one way to say, I am lazy and I don't care, right? <laughs> I shall name you, name. You remember the old Oreo commercial, right? You know, they're, they're, they're in the board meeting. They just discovered Oreos, made Oreos, and they're trying to come up with a creative name. And, and there's this loser intern over, you know, over here. He's lazy and everything. He's just shoving Oreos in his mouth. And the CEO says, Harold, what do you think we should name it? Because all the other ones said, dunk cookies and all this sort of goofy stuff. And he says, Oreo. And he says, Harold, you're a genius. Right? I mean, I love that commercial. That is, that's good stuff. And, and that's what Noah does with his oldest son, Sham. <laughs> name. Right? His second son is Hot. <laughs> I don't know what to do with that. Heat. This is what he named them, right? It was a sunny day in, in, in East Frankfurt when this child was born, and I don't want him to forget about it. I lost so much weight and sweat. And finally, Japheth means opened. I have no idea what to do with these names. Remember that whenever you name your child things. I've told you before, uh, I believe my name means a, a large field in which cattle raid, or cattle roam, right? Kyle Edward, right? Do with that whatever you want. You should, you should probably, probably look that up. Okay. Um, real quick. Purpose of the genealogies. One is uh, it connects the story of Noah to creation. We talked about that. It, it, it shows that uh, man fulfills the command to be fruitful and multiply. And, and we also see the pattern that man, that man lives and dies. I once preached Genesis 5, this genealogy, at a funeral. And it works so good. Because it allows you to pound the point that you will die soon too. And this is the way of man. But only one has truly broken the sting of death, and that is Christ. And it's right here in the text between Enoch and Noah. It's right there. It's one of my favorite uh, funerals in terms of exegetically I, I did. Finally, there's the contrast of, of pagan beliefs. We, we talked about that. Okay, I'll just throw these up here in case you're interested. Uh, these are the lives. Uh, Methuselah is the longest. Uh, Jared is the second. Adam being the third. Do with that whatever you want. All right. Um, so, that is the end of, of, of the genealogy. We'll get more genealogy in Genesis. I know you can't wait. But next week, Lord willing, we will start the story of Noah. We may not make it very far because of these sons of God stuff. Okay? So I'm really curious to see what you all's thoughts are on the Son of God. 
do you think it's part of this genealogical narrative, or is it the watchers like Enoch has, or angels and demons and humans and all that mix and stuff? So I'm interested to see what you all think. But we have like three or four weeks before we take a trip to the ark. Hopefully, it'll start raining in our story by then. We're not going to make it to the end of chapter 9, I'm sure, but maybe we'll get a little bit of rain. And uh, hopefully Lane can, can uh, walk us through a tour or whatnot, uh, but if he can't, we'll still correct everything he gets wrong. All right, does that, does that work for you? <laughs> yeah. I'd like to hear Cheney's uh, tour, too. That, that would be fascinating. Uh, yeah, yeah, so, um, so uh, very much looking forward to that. Speaking of the art, we have a, uh, a sign-up sheet out here on the opportunity table. Please sign up for that. Um, um, put who all's going. We're going to try to buy the tickets online the Monday before we leave. Okay? And the church is committing to pay $10 of your ticket. Okay? So uh, we want as many people who, who want to go to go. Um, we can't take the van, so we, we just got a carpool. Um, but I'm really looking forward to that, and I think, think, think it'll, it'll be good. If you cannot go, but you want to support someone who may not be able to afford to go, we can work something out with that as well. Uh, but we're not going to have anyone not go because they can't afford it. Uh, the Ark is a really neat place. And at this point, it's the only thing we can do in light of COVID. I'm sorry, we can't do a lot of outreach. We can't do nothing fancy. Probably not going to be able to do VBS. I don't know what else to do. So we're just going to stand on a boat and, uh, you know, talk about the good old days. <laughs> you know. So, all right. With that, um, let's stand up and pray since we're not supposed to hold hands. Andy may be watching. Um, and uh, we will be dismissed. All right, I'm, I'm tired of talking. Um, Lane, will you just close us in prayer? Yeah. Uh, God, thank you.